Nigel Short at the time rated 2684. This was played in uh, December 20th, 2015 uh, in Minsk at the European Rapid Championship. So this is a rapid game. So that might affect the quality. But here's an E4 opening for you, uh, Joe Slime. And E5. Knight F3, Knight C6, two, four knights game here. And then H3. So H3, that seems like a very premature H3 there. But, I mean, it was... The most common move here is bishop b5. Second most common is pawn to d4. So you get a Spanish game here. Pawn to d4, a scotch variation here. Those are the two most common moves. h3 only has played 61 times in the database. So curious move. Perhaps um, Nigel's playing this move just to get out of um, well-charted territory. Pawn to d5. Pawn takes pawn. Knight takes pawn. Now bishop to b5. Knight takes knight. B takes knight, bishop d6, and with castles, we reach the first unique position. First, game, first position unique to this specific game. Black also castles. This is a fairly standard looking setup. Pawn to d5, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and pawn to a6, playing a little prevent defense there. And I thought rook e1 here, but uh, pawn to C3 securing the central pawn first. And queen to F6. Okay, so bishop to D3. Now this pawn is serving double duty as well. Black brings his bishop out of bed to put the question to the opponent's bishop. Hello, Brooklyn. Welcome. How's your um, space odyssey coming? So rook to b1, occupying the half-open file, heating up the b7 pawn, which moves to b6. Now a super attack forces the bishop on f5 to trade off for the bishop on d3. Now rook a to e8. I'm always confused myself as to which rook to play out. Invariably, I always choose the wrong one. Brooklyn in the chess vibe today. There's nothing aiming at f2, and it's got some support, so my inclination here would be don't close off the f rook, just slide it over to e8. In some positions, it probably doesn't matter at all. 
and this may be one of those positions. But generally, I tend to make the wrong choice between the two when I do my analysis on my games. I don't. I just don't like the feel of having this rook. Um, I mean. I get claustrophobic with my pieces, and I don't like that rook not having any way to move. Um, but this is more to the point here. Okay, this makes rook a e8 very understandable. Because now if you have a queen trade, you have two open lines for your rooks. And a queen trade is made. Okay, that makes perfect sense now. Thank you for the clarification from today's Grandmaster Grant Melkumian. So rook to c1. Pawn to g5. King to f1. Where's that knight going? I'm assuming the purpose of knight e7 is to push the pawn to either c6 or c5. Uh, probably c5 puts the question to the d pawn. D pawn would then not be able to pass because of the knight. And then on a capture, you've got your bishop in a better position. Knight f4 is, or a knight, not f, knight g6, f4, is also a possible destination here, says Plucro. So now the purpose of this move is to allow a pawn to advance to d5 in the event of a c5 here. And so now Plucro's plan is played. Knight to g6, rook drops to b3, and bishop to f4 with the knight ultimately coming to f4 in the event of a trade. Would he play, would he take it with the knight? Or would it be better to take it with the rook and get the rook over? Well, it doesn't matter because black's not, I mean, white's not complying with black's plan. So now rook to e4, bishop to b4, and rook to f7. Now, why not e8? Why not e8 here? Or even maybe d8. Oops, wrong way. I'm not real sure. Rook to f7. I mean, apparently he wants to stay in line with the opponent's king, which is a reasonable desire. So g3 heats the bishop up. Bishop to d6. Rook to e1. And the rooks are traded. Rook takes rook, bishop takes rook. I actually favor these pawns here. I prefer these pawns right now to black's position. Now knight relocating itself to e7, bishop to d2. And now knight to f5.
King e2, rook e7 check, and now the king is in the center of the board. Very well prepared for an end game. Pawn to c5 is going to compel d5, and it does. So now this pawn becomes a critical target. Okay. Knight's undefended. Let's put it in danger. Pawn behind it is undefended, so you have a skewer being threatened here. Forces the king then back to e2. And we have a quick repetition, a common method of um, grandmasters to buy a few moves on the chess clock. Repeating the position a couple of times to save time for more important thinking later. So after bishop to c7, bishop to c3, rook back to e7. Ha! Huh. Let's take a look at this move. I did not consider that, would not have considered that probably. Very interesting. Plucro, are you familiar with this theme? So after, ooh, a little bit of a desperado here by white. Yep. So after this check, he moves, and then the knight is hanging. So therefore, white plays the desperado, knight takes g5. And after h takes g5, f takes g3. Instead of taking with the knight, Black makes his presence known with rook to d e3, following the same theme, but with the pieces on better squares, better coordination here. So this is also a very good learning moment here. Instead of taking right away with the knight to get the extra pawn on the king's side, leave the knight over here where it's looking toward the king and get your rook on a better place. Nice little instructive move there. Plus now the H-man is in question to boot. So, bishop to e5, rook g2 check, now the A-man can be captured, and it is. Really good moves here by Grant Malkumian. Instead of bishop e5, can white try rook a3? Um... So rook a3, we also, the problem white has is all these loose pawns here. Remember I said c5 is going to become a target. So suppose rook a3, I like the idea of at least trying to attack, but if knight comes here, I mean, you've got a lot of pieces, a lot of pawns under attack. But it does seem like white's only real hope for staying into the game is making this D-man somehow good. So I'm not sure what um, white does about this attack as well. 
This is, I think, by now. You got a fork if white takes pawn on e4. Da, 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 da. Oh, all right, let's have a look here. You're saying come here and play this? No, the, the rook is hanging. You can't. That's e5, though. You said something about e4. Oh, you prefer to come this way and forget about the pawn? Yeah, that's even better. Yeah, that's even more better. Play here. Because black doesn't care about this pawn. It's going to be weak for a long, long time. This wins a, the whole bishop. All right, so that... So knight d6, for sure. I was only looking at this, but this is an even better continuation. I didn't even notice that. These two pieces being in the dovetail. So this is the dovetail. The, the, the swallowtail is the, is the one where they're spread wider. Yeah, that gets a bookum for sure. Uh, so, but in the game, the bishop played to e5, rook to g2, a man is hanging, d6. Again, this is white's only last remaining hope is can I do anything with this um, pawn? But the king comes in just in time to stop any ideas of promotion. And after king to e7, king to e4, knight heating up the rook and forcing a trade there. Rook to g3, rook to ace, a5. <laughs> White is really throwing his last effort at this, that's for sure. Pawn to h4, king takes d7, pawn takes g5, pawn to g6, rook to h3. This is a rapid game, so you're going to see the game played right to the end in most rapid games. I mean, they, they really are reluctant to resign and t when their time's ticking away. Rook takes a7. King to c5. Rook to c7. Check. King to b4. It's interesting that he would play king to d3 rather than taking the pawn. Um... I, the idea is to use this pawn, your opponent's pawn, as a bit of an obstacle. Well, this is really nice. Rook to c5. That's nice. Rook to b7. Rook to c6. King takes. Rook takes c4 check. King to d5, still fighting, pawn to b5, and that's where white finally throws in the towel.